the world looks to California to answer the hard questions for redemption, to introduce the unfamiliar, to be resilient. Because California bounces back, holds us accountable, values who we are, remains vigilant, defies those in our way, and stands for community. Here on the West Coast, we're at the center of it all. Los Angeles Times, the state of what's next.
Good evening. I'm Donna Wares, editor of the LA Times Book Club. You know, ever since we launched our community book club, we've heard from readers who wanted to know, when are you going to invite Lisa C? So uh, we listened, and she said yes. And tonight, LA novelist Lisa C is our very special guest. Lisa is the author of three mysteries, but she's best known for her historical fiction that transports readers into unfamiliar worlds across the globe. Her latest bestseller is The Island of Sea Women, a novel about the legendary free divers of the Korean island of Jeju. Leah, Lisa takes us inside a culture where these fearless women venture into the ocean depths to provide for their families, while their husbands stay home to care for the children. It's a deeply researched story of friendship, tragedy, and forgiveness that spans eight decades. This evening, Lisa will be in conversation with my colleague, Pulitzer Prize winning writer, Mary McNamara. And now I'd like to welcome Lisa and Mary to the Los Angeles Times Virtual Book Club stage. Hi, Mary and Lisa, how are you doing? Great, thank you for having me. And it's so yeah. nice to see you, Mary. I know, I've admired you from afar. <laughs> I wish we were doing this in person, but obviously everybody wishes that all the time. Right, that's true. I'm happy we can do this. Well, Me too. thank you, thank you both for um, joining us from home. Um, it's um, really uh, very excited to have you both. And I wanted to start off um, by just asking you to uh, talk a little bit about your writing during these these many uh, months of pandemic here in LA. Lisa, I know you normally spend a lot of time traveling uh, to talk about your books and uh, doing book events and. Um, uh, that hasn't happened. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how things are going and, and how you're faring during pandemic? Yeah, so the Island of Sea Women came out in paperback last March, and I was supposed to go out for six weeks, and I went out for five days, five states in five days, and then they canceled the tour and I came home. And I thought that one thing that I could do was talk to book clubs, and I've always talked to book clubs way back in the day in person, and then on speakerphone and then Skype and now, of course, Zoom. And I've been talking to book clubs, not only around our country, but around the world. And that's been fantastic. But, you know, the thing about not traveling is that it leaves a lot of other time to just work and write. And so that's what I've been doing. And uh, Mary, um, Mary is uh, the Times culture columnist, and and she writes about arts and entertainment, television, you name it. But um, you've also spent a lot of time uh, writing about what it's like, including the fact that all of us here in Los Angeles, one of my favorite columns recently, is about how all of us have forgotten how to drive. Um, <laughs> I, th I think that was just last week, and I definitely identified with that. Um, can you just talk a little bit about your work and uh, what your focus is now and what you've been working on? Well, it's been very interesting to be a culture columnist at this particular time when so much of what we think of as culture, um, books notwithstanding, television notwithstanding, has been shut down. And so it really is kind of you know this very rare moment where we're experiencing history at, but we're like we're experiencing in a very internal way, and so I've been I've been trying to write about that. Obviously, politics has been uh, you know uh, at the forefront of many conversations and at the forefront of our culture right now, having to go through the past couple of weeks uh, an election that took what a week before uh, Victor was declared, almost a week, um, and then obviously the events of of January 6th. I mean, so it's it's been uh, kind of a wild ride. <laughs> and I wrote the the driving thing was like, also, I just wanted to write something funny. Because <laughs> it's like, well, sometimes it's a little hard, although things are looking up now, now that we have our vaccinations and, uh, and hope that maybe someday we will get back. But to I that. love that piece, Mary, because it's so true. It's I feel like we've all lost our muscle memory of how to, how to drive. I know. And, uh, and either people are driving really fast because you know, the streets are empty or just like they forgot you know, like how to change lanes. Well, not just that, but I think people are so used to driving in a pack in the, and they're so used to driving in traffic that when they're not, it is exactly what you said, muscle memory. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've missed a turn off because it just didn't take enough time to get there. You know, it's like, that yeah. can't be. It's like, because we, in Los Angeles, you measured 
uh, your commutes by time, you know, as much as distance, which is, and so that's changed. And then also we just haven't been driving. And, you know, when, when you're, you know, you, it's been almost a year really since we've been making like the kind of travel the, you know, just cross town to go to the Grove or whatever, you know, so it's, it's not surprising and we're distracted. <laughs> Well, staying at home so much, um, I know a lot of people are spending a lot more time on Twitter, and I, I follow Lisa quite a bit, and I noticed um, that you've been pretty brave lately, uh, that you were going to be out there and that you um, uh, trusted your husband to give you a haircut, and I, I must That's say, um, uh, it's pretty amazing. Can you tell us how that went? Well, you can see how it went. I think you did a great job. And, um, but you know, it, it was because of the photo for the times and I hadn't had a haircut in 10 months and I was looking sort of like a mangy dog, to be honest. And so, um, although my husband has been offering to cut my hair for the last <laughs> year, finally it was like, okay, we're gonna do this thing. I've been cutting his hair all along and he looks okay too. But um, yeah, I think, you know, I think he did a pretty good job. I definitely, uh, I have to agree. It can be a side career for him. <laughs> I just, I need to ask you, do you like have special scissors? Cause we've tried to do that too, but we don't have like hair. So we're like using yeah, these the, scissors. The, that all all about the hair. Yeah, it's all about the hair cutting scissors for sure. Yeah. <laughs> they they really make a big difference. <laughs> and I've even gotten good at the, you know, the, the like razor thing that cleans up on men around here. So uh, I don't know what that's called. Oh, well, that sounds great. We haven't we haven't been that brave at our house, but you know, you never know how long this is uh, going to continue. You know, for this uh, past month, we've all been reading and and talking about the island of sea women. Um, it's really been fun. We've had an amazing just outpouring from readers who um, either enjoyed the book before or just discovering it and been joining the conversation, and and that's really been fun. Um, we've also had quite a few questions from readers. And we're going to be sharing those uh, after our conversation. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is um, <coughs> our book our book club partner this evening is Diesel Bookstore. And Lisa, thank you for going over there and venturing out and um, signing copies. So uh, we always have a, a we like to support independent booksellers with the book club. We can't do in person events, uh, so we've. Um, been partnering with different bookstores for every event and, and Lisa was nice enough to go to Diesel and sign a book. So we have special books for this event. Um, uh, that's pretty much my uh, last commercial. We'll, um, we'll go, come back and do some reader questions, but now I'd, I'd like to uh, turn the conversation over to Mary. Have fun guys. Thanks. I'm so Thanks. excited to cover up this book. I loved it so much. Um, and I have so many questions. Uh, before I start though, I need to tell you, my best friend from high school who lives in Maryland, um, found out I was doing this, uh, doing this talk with you and she sent me this text and I wanna read it to you. Um, for those of us with adopted children from Asia, her books helped unlock the culture and history for us in a way that no other author has before. Please thank her for me. Uh, oh, that was something. I had never thought of, because I'm a terrible friend, obviously, and, you know, I do not have an adopted Asian child. So, but um, that, you know, that kind of relationship, too, with, with those kinds of families uh, must be pretty astonishing for you. Um, my friend said that you were, like, on a suggested reading list for her group when they went to China to adopt their children. Um, so on behalf of all of those families, thank you. And for my friend as well. <laughs> yeah, that I mean, that has been such an incredible community of readers for me. Um, you know, from the very beginning, starting with On Gold Mountain, um, I've you know have been involved with um, families with children from China. But you know, not this book, but the one before, The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, right. actually looks at adoption from China and. There's a mother who gives up her baby in China and, and the baby is adopted by a family in Pasadena. And I, that gave me the opportunity to interview young women all across the country who had been adopted from China. And that those relationships with those young women, you know, whether I interviewed them for the book or now they've just read the book last week, you know, have, have really 
been very strong and very, very powerful. Just uh, just last week, I had an e sort of a you know flurry of emails with a young woman who, uh, when her family, her mother left her by the side of the road, she had some papers to stuck in her clothes. And just now, you know, she's about 20, just now have them translated. So all of a sudden, she knows a lot more about where she came from, where she was born, you know, not, well, she knew where she was born, but, you know, when she was born, what the circumstances were, what her mother and father wished for her. And for her to share all of that with me has just, you know, been very, very powerful, very meaningful to me. That's amazing. I mean, it, because it really is, I mean, that is a hallmark of your, of your work is that um, there is a contextualization, there is an examination of history, but always, 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 there's that a very personal, um, you know, the day-to-day -day living that, and also like that introspection. So to sort of, you know, bring that forward, that's pretty astonishing. Right. And I think for me, you know, having grown up here in Los Angeles, I mean, obviously I have red hair, freckles, but I come from a very large Chinese American family here in Los Angeles. And I lived with my mom when I was a little girl, but her family was tiny. My father's side of the family, about 400 people. And there were about a dozen that looked like me, the majority still full Chinese and then the spectrum in between. And so when I was a kid, although again, I lived with my mom when I was with my father's side of the family and I looked around me, what I saw were Chinese faces, Chinese, you know, experienced Chinese culture, Chinese tradition, Chinese language, Chinese food. And that's why I write the kinds of books that I do. But just going back to that adoptee community, you know, I don't look like everyone in my family. And for many of them, they don't look like everyone in their family. And I feel like we've had this kind of mirror image experience. And that was why I had wanted to explore that, um, you know, sort of identity. And how do you decide who you are? Is it, is it by what you look like? Is it how you were raised? You know, am I, for me, you know, am I Chinese? Am I Chinese American? Am I American or am I something else? And I know that many of these adoptees have thought the same thing. You know, what am I? Am I Chinese because of what I look like? Am I American because of how I was raised? Am I Chinese American culturally or am I something else? Well, and also just the, the history of, of your native land. Um, Chinese history is not something that's taught very often or with any kind of depth in American schools. Right. This is a wonderful way. Um, or Korean, Korean history. history. Or Korean history. So good transition. So let's get let's get to the island of the sea women. Um, in trying to figure out what I was going to ask you first, you know, I really don't like to ask anybody about process because I, you know, first of all, it sounds super pretentious. And second of all, it's, you know, such an open-ended question. But Lisa C., I just have to know, like, how did you go about writing this book? I mean, I read in our story uh, that ran earlier this month, um, you know, that you had seen a, uh, a short uh, magazine article about these women. Now, you know, that happens to me too. And like, I'll just maybe do a little more research and or maybe write a column or something. You went, I mean, what did you, you wrote this like just captivating, um, you know, revelation of history of a culture and a, a time with which I was absolutely unfamiliar, grounding it in, as you always do, in characters, that you absolutely recognize. Um, but what I want to know as, as a writer myself, literally, what did you do? You read the article and then you... I, so I was in a doctor's office waiting, you know, to be called in like we all, this is, we've all been there, right? And I saw this tiny article. It's just one paragraph, one small photo, and I just ripped it right out of the magazine and brought it home. <laughs> So now, you know, for all the people who are watching who live in Los Angeles, when you go to the doctor and you think, what happened to this magazine, you'll know I was there first. Anyway, uh, you know, just like you said, Mary, I, you know, I, I collect things and um, what can I say? You know, I, I always have a file of ideas, but then in my free time, you know, I'll poke around on the internet to see what I can find. I live pretty close to UCLA. I, until the pandemic, I used to just for fun, go over to one, the research libraries there. And again, just kind of poke around. So I was slowly collecting material about the Henyo, the sea women. 
Um, but it wasn't until, I guess, about five years ago that UNESCO gave the divers the designation of an intangible world heritage tradition. And part of the reason they did that was that UNESCO was anticipating that this culture was going to disappear from the earth within 15 years. So that would be 10 years from now. And by that time, I knew that a lot of these divers were in their 70s, 80s, early 90s. And, you know, you take a big risk waiting 5, 10, 15 years to go and interview people who were in their late 80s, early 90s. So that's what made it, you know, all of a sudden, like, if I'm going to do this, I have to do it now. And I'm so glad that I did because I wouldn't have been able to go last year. I, you know, probably wouldn't be able to go this year. And I'm frankly a little dubious about next year for, you know, that big kind of international travel. So what was, what was the time between when you first saw the article and when you decided, okay, you know, I'm going to get on a plane? Eight years. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so... But, uh, but I think about books for a very long... I mean, <laughs> until the one that I'm just starting, uh, I typically think about them for a really long time before I decide this is the one. And often for me, it's like, what's my way into the story? Like, um, or why now, you know, with Island of Sea Women, it was all of a sudden the sort of time pressure of, okay, you know, this culture is going to disappear. I've got to do it now. But sometimes it's really, it's just like, sometimes they're very obvious ways to tell a story, but I just feel like I have to have my way in. And that can take a long time for me, apparently. So, you know, deciding, though, that you need to do it now is not the same as finding your way in as a writer. So is this different for you? Did you go start your research process more open-ended? Did you have a character in mind? Um, at what point did you decide that you were going to set it in this, you know, in the time period that you did? and find your main characters. Yeah. How did that work with this one? Yeah, so I actually I'm going to talk just about um, Tigrel of Hummingbird Lane for a second. So I, like I said earlier, I'd been thinking about writing about adoption and the one-child policy for truly 20 years. And um, my husband and I, we were going to the movies in Santa Monica. We were crossing the street, and I saw an older white couple walking with their adopted teenage Chinese daughter between them. She had her hair in a ponytail and it was swishing back and forth like this. And I had this vision of her as being kind of like a fox spirit in that family. And in Chinese tradition, fox spirits can be um, pretty naughty and mischievous. They're always doing things like sneaking into a scholar's study late at night. You know, there he's studying hard for the imperial exams and then she has sex with him. But in their best moments, fox spirits have this ability to bring great love and, and to create families. And so when I saw that foxtail, it was like, well, yes, yeah, she is like a fox spirit in that family in the sense that through her presence, she had brought great love and it helped to create a family. And so truly from one side of the street to the other, I knew what the next book was going to be. But mostly I had my way in. Now, with Island of Sea Women, it was very different because I, I didn't, I mean, I was motivated by something else, which was, if I'm going to do this, I've got to do it now. And when I start thinking about a novel, I think about three things kind of simultaneously. What's the main relationship? What's the main emotion? And what's the historic backdrop? So for this, I had the historic backdrop, the Henyo. But I knew that no matter what the next book was going to be, that I wanted to write about forgiveness. And, you know, for the people who are watching tonight, if you've read other, of, others of my books, you know that I've kind of tiptoed around forgiveness um, in a lot of them. Snowflower and the Secret Fan, you know, two best friends, bad thing happens, they split apart. Spoiler alert, Snowflower dies, so the end of the book is more about atonement. In Shanghai Girls, two sisters, bad thing happens, they split apart. And that book actually required a, a sequel. And Pearl and May do find forgiveness, but they're on separate continents. They can't see each other. And so they only, you know, they only see each other on the last page. So this was something they had to come to themselves. I won't go through every book, but believe me, it's a theme I keep coming to. And so I knew that no matter what, I wanted to write about forgiveness, which actually sent me back to the history. 
and in particular the 4-3 incident. I'm sure you'll want to talk more about that. But you know, here was this this massacre that happened on Jeju Island, where between 30 and 80 thousand people were killed. And then after that, there were 50 years of government enforced secrecy. And so um, today, though, this island is recognized internationally as the island of peace. It's a model along with um, South Africa and Rwanda for forgiveness. And so here I had, you know, right in the history, the very emotion that I wanted to write about. Mm -hmm. And you, I'll just say one more thing that, you know, with, with forgiveness, right, it works on so many levels, right? It's one-on-one, -on -one, it's within families, it's sometimes with your neighbor, it's societies and cultures, it's countries, and everything in between. And I felt because of the 4-3 incident, I could actually hit, you know, that very personal level of forgiveness within families, within cultures, and then again, with, you know, to more with countries as well. Now, I know you did, you went to the island and you did extensive interviews with, uh, with the women. I, I'm a, were there any who had survived the 4-3 incident or yes. had families? There were. And so, yeah, because I was really, you know, I really wanted to find women who were in their late 80s, early 90s, who not only had lived through the 4-3 incident, but actually had memories of the Japanese colonial period. Mm -hmm. So when you went, did you have your character, your main character or your main relationship in mind? Or did you find them while you were interviewing the women? I can't remember. <laughs> I may have had them in mind already, um, but I, I honestly don't remember. I can tell you what I thought about for both of them, which is uh, the aphorism: "If you raise red, if you plant red beans, you'll raise red beans." And I, you know, that who you are as a child is who you're going to become as an adult, and how you know, as a child, you can kind of get a stamp on your forehead that sort of sets your your future. Uh, and so I thought about Jung Suk and how she's the daughter of the chief of the collective. So it's kind of expected that one day she'll grow up and take her mother's place. And, and you know, she does. It just happens to be a pretty bumpy road. But it, you know, from that childhood, she's got this pretty positive stamp. And then with Mija, she's the daughter of Japanese collaborators. And so she too has a stamp on her forehead, but it's a pretty negative one. You know, this is somebody who you can't trust. And to have that from childhood and how that would affect you from childhood all the way, you know, through your, throughout your life. Well, that's, I mean, that's a theme that you also examine in, in Snowflower too, this idea of being raised by, in part, by a separate family, by having class or caste differences, by, you know, th there being these predetermined um, definitions of, what the world can expect of you and what you can expect of the world. And that seems to be like a leap motif throughout your work. Mm -hmm. um, when, uh, I'm sorry, when you went to um, the island, were you familiar with the, with the horrible brutality of the, of the incident? Because I was not. And I, I had already learned about that. And I, you know, you have to be so grateful for journalists right? who <laughs> do, do a lot of work ahead of time so that, that it helps me so much. And so I had been looking at articles in Jeju Island English language newspaper. And there was one woman in particular who wrote a lot about the Henyo. And it turned out, you know, and I was able to know how that you have this, Mary, you know, at the end of your article that has your email address. And this also had her email address and Hilti. And so I wrote to her, and she was so unbelievably helpful to me. She is kind of, um, she, I'm actually the official ambassador to the Henyo. And so she arranged for me to meet different scholars and people at the Oceanographic Institute. And uh, she took me to meet the head shaman of the island, the top woman shaman. And of course, not, not all of the interviews that I did with the divers, but many of them. But the other thing that she did was before I went, she was just sending me just tremendous amounts of material, including 
the human rights report that had been done on the 4-3 incident. And this um, human rights report is the longest ongoing human rights report in the world to this day. It's, on, it's still ongoing. And when I had it, it was already 755 pages long. And because it was an international, is an international project, they had access to Korean government and military records, U.S. government and military records, but they also interviewed people on all sides of the conflict. So most of the report are these first-person um, stories of what people went through or, you know, what they did, because again, it's from all sides of, of what happened. I ask you that because um, one of the things that strikes me about your the voice of your main character here and also in some of your other books is there's, I, I've been trying to think of what the right word is. I, it's like detachment, but it's not detached. There's a calmness of the it's like a chronicling. I mean, you feel the person, you feel the person emotionally, but you don't get sidetracked into huge spirals of anger or depression or love. Or It's a very controlled, you're, she's a very controlled narrator. And the way that she describes that incident, which is so horrifying and which you had to know um, many of your readers would be coming to for the first time. I just wondered if like your choice of how much did the knowledge that you were going to have to describe this horrifying, you know, uh, massacre and all the violence that preceded it and followed it, how much did that contribute to like sort of finding the voice of your main character? Whose yeah. name I mispronounced. Well, I think I have to put a couple of different things into this. So um, I, I don't know if detached is actually the right word because what I'm trying to do is just be in the room with whoever the narrator is, you know, the main character. And so uh, I remember this with Snowflower and the Secret Fan. And uh, one of the early, early readers, uh, one of the uh, young women in my agent's office who read it and said, you, know, you have to be more critical about foot binding. And so, uh, no, I don't have to be critical. I just want to be in the room. And if you read that, you're, you're not going to come away saying, foot binding, what a great idea. You know, that, that if you can just be there. And, and I actually think this time we're living through right now, it, there's so much hardship and so much fear, actually. You know, am I going to get the virus? If I get the virus, what's going to happen? If some, you know, is my dad going to get it? Is my father-in-law? I mean, you know, there's just so much anxiety and fear around it. And yet we are all going forward and living our lives. And so I, you know, I think in 50 years from now, people might read about this time period and think, how could people have been so calm about it? You know, how could they have just gone on with their lives? But that's what happens in history. You know, people have to, you, you can't just like go in your room and put the covers over your head. You have to keep moving forward. You have to feed the kids. You have to educate the kids. You have to um, make sure the family is feel safe and and all of those things that keep family and culture going, that all happens even in wartime, even in a pandemic, even if you're getting your feet bound. And so that's I so I just look at it that way is I just want to be in the room. And then with Young Sook herself, I, I can't say that she's, you know, completely based on one woman, but there was one person who there was one aspect to her personality that really, I think, kind of infused Young Sook. So um, there were lots of different ways that I interviewed the divers. Some of the interviews were you know, really in-depth, in a woman's home, two to eight hours. Then I would also go to where women were going into the sea and coming out of the sea. And those, just by their nature, were short, you know, because you're kind of grabbing people. Can I talk to you for a couple of minutes? And then the last group were these women who 
uh, sit on the shore and they gather and sort the seaweed and algae that's washed ashore overnight. And I just loved those women. I mean, just, I was crazy for them. But there was one, and I'd been on this one beach sort of going around, you know, and, and the thing about these women, they have unbelievable peripheral vision because you have to have that to survive under the sea. So even though they're on this shore, you know, they're just, they're like really aware of everything around them. Anyway, this woman, she was clearly watching me as I talked to these three people. And as I approached, she shouted out, I was the best Henyo. Well, they all say that, you know, I was the best. Oh, no, 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 I was the best. But she, she was like, no, I really was the best. And she, she, you know, she may in fact have been because at the Henyo Museum, they did have these big photographs of her. They had a, a documentary about her that ran on a continuous loop. So, you know, in fact, maybe she was. But anyway, she was that, that fist, you know, and this just, I was the best one. And then at one point, she kind of leaned forward and confided, you know, I was so good under the sea, I could cook a meal under there. And I, you know, I'm just writing that down because it's the best line. But it, to me, that was those sort of two things. One was I was the best, but saying it in a way that meant she really was the best. And then also like, you know, that pride, of like, I'm so good, I could cook a meal under there. And that, that kind of bragging, which I just love. So even though Young Sook is, goes through so much and has so much tragedy, she has incredible pride in her work and in her abilities. Yes, and I mean, there's a toughness about all of the women. I mean, what's, you know, one of the things that's also astonishing about the book is the description of what is, what, what, wait, they don't call it a matriarchal, they call it a what? A matrifocal. Matrifocal society, in which the women are like sort of, um, you know, talking and boasting in a way that in Western, in our society is more often considered or was more often considered ma masculine. And also they're like sort of, they talk about their, husbands you know it's like well what are they good for but just sitting under the tree with the kids and drinking all my wages <laughs> which yeah. is really interesting and is that I mean did you experience that in in talking to the women because one of the things that I did want to ask you about your research is you make a big point um and we'll talk about this in a larger aspect about the you know many of the women were illiterate so there is I'm assuming like not a ton of journals, not a ton of like, you know, uh, source material beyond interviews. Is that correct? Or were there well, they some- they haven't, you know, they haven't produced it because right. like you said, they are illiterate, but there's, um, you know, I, I did find about 20 different scientific studies that have been done on them, you know, for a lot of different things. You know, they have this have this reputation of having the greatest ability of any human group on earth to withstand cold water. Um, but they, the other studies that have looked at their ears, have looked at their hips, of one study was, and this is true, uh, was looking to see if these women were somehow genetically connected to the Weddell seal. And, you know, those people got money for that study. I could have told them they probably were not related to seals. So the, the, the ways I get material, you know, are just from a lot of different sources and a lot of different ways to kind of look, look at them, but nothing that they've written themselves. And so, um, you know, almost everything came from, um, there was one, dis well, just things that other people have written, particularly about this, the scientific stuff but I did find a dissertation that was done in the early 1970s, written by an anthropologist who lived on a small island just, just offshore of Jeju. It's still considered part of Jeju, um, but it's Udo Island. So she lived on this tiny, tiny island in a little village of divers for two years. And that was incredibly helpful to me. Um, and then what else? You know, just there, I found a documentary that was done in the late, 50s, I think, in black and white that follows a little girl who's learning how to dive. I have a link to that on my website uh, if people want to look at it, and it's great. I mean, it's just you see her as a little girl. She, you know, in the morning ties her brother to her back and goes out and gathers firewood and hauls water for the family. But my favorite part is you know, she is learning to become a diver. And there's this one scene where 
five little girls, and she's one of them, have come out of the water, and they're sitting on a bench on the on the boat. And it's very windy there, and it's very cold there, and they've come out of this cold weather water. They have their little homemade, you know, bathing suit. And the five little girls are just, you know, just sitting there shivering, and they're just learning how to how to take the cold. And um, so, you know, that was very helpful. So there, there's so many different ways that I was able to get information. But the main, of course, was interviewing the women themselves. And so some of the incidents, did you take particular incidents that they described to you? Like I was thinking about the octopus attack or, you know, some of the, the, the thing with getting, you know, her mother. I don't want to spoil anything, but the uh, incident. Abalone. Yeah, where she, her hook gets caught. Yes. I mean, were those things yes. that actually so, happened to people? So I just have to say, I know that the octopus is a very evolved creature and, you know, there are all those wonderful books and the documentary about how great they are, but they really scare me. <laughs> they just really scare me. And I, I don't know if you've ever had that encounter with one where they're just like, you know, then you pull this arm, this set off, well, arm off, and then there's, oh, now it's over here. And so that really was something that I, that scene that I just took my great fear and went with it. But after the book came out, there is a, um, he's an Italian photographer who works for National Geographic, and he's, he has taken a lot of photos of these women. And there was one photo that I guess after he read the book, he sent it to me, and it was just like my nightmare. You know, this gigantic, this small woman with this gigantic octopus. And I just thought, you know, yeah, <laughs> that could happen. And then with the abalone, you know, harvesting abalone was and still is one of the main ways that women die. And so I just, but I, I just, I don't remember where I was when I first saw that, you know, but I'm like, you know, doing research and I saw that and I was just like, death by abalone. So we're going to have to have that, you know? And I was just like, ooh! And I know a lot of people have, have helped People help them with research, but I that's my favorite part. And I never know what I'm gonna find. It's like this big treasure hunt. And so, you know, for me, it's like oh, death by abalone. And then it's a matter of well, where does that come in the story? Is it the beginning, the middle, and the end? Is it what's the read? Why is it there? What are the ripple effects? How do you, I mean, again, I hate asking about process, but with stories like this, where um, you are not like, you know, a, a natural expert in this. You became an expert to write this book. So you are learning as you are thinking about a novel, which is different than, you know, something that you are very familiar with and then you decide to use in a novel. So my, so do you like assemble all of your research and then, you know, just sort of sit with it and then find the story? Or do you have the story and then find the research like you were talking about we need the mom to die what would be a good way for that to happen yeah so i actually think about it almost like signposts um there are certain signposts i can't move you know that are just historical the uh, the bombing of hiroshima i can't change that date the four three incident i not only can i not change that date it's in the name of it, 4-3, April 3rd. So those are kind of like permanent signposts. And then there are the things that I find like harvesting an abalone and, and death by abalone. Well, I can put that anywhere. It's a movable signpost. And then there are the signposts that really have to do with story. So here you have a friendship. Well, these two little girls have to meet. Um, there, I knew that I wanted them to do itinerant work and go to Vladivostok in winter because I just thought that stuff was amazing. Uh, I knew that, you know, that at some point they're going to get married. Well, people are, especially in a time when people didn't have birth control, are going to have babies. It takes about nine months to have a baby. So those, those also are signposts. And some of those, that stuff is kind of movable, but some of it isn't. And so when I sit down to write, um, I know where I'm going, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. That's what happens in the, in the actual writing that day. 
So did these women actually give birth in the sea? I need to know that because some did, that, yes. And like that while they were was working. one of the things when I would once interviewing women, you know, one of the I'm, I am a woman. I write about women. I bet a lot of the people watching tonight are women. And we do have our unique biology, right? So I have not shied away over the years from asking, you know, what happens when you get your period? How do you take care of yourself when you're pregnant? Are there foods you're allowed to eat, not allowed to eat, things you're allowed to do, not allowed to do? What are the traditions around childbirth? And anyway, with, with this, one of the things I asked was, what did you wish for when you were pregnant? And I've asked this of a lot of women over the years. And typically the answer is I just wanted my baby to be born healthy. But these women, not every single one, but almost all of them said, I only wished for one thing. And that was to have my baby in the field and in the field meant in the water while she was diving. And, you know, if she couldn't do that. She'd get up on the boat for the last couple of hours of labor, have her baby on the deck and then be back in the water two days later. That is, you know, a, there is a tradition of people, you know, even now people. No, absolutely. In, in a bathtub. Or, in a, not down, you know, a thousand. No, not that far down. Bathtub. I don't think they were going way down. <laughs> they weren't having their babies 60 feet under the water. <laughs> While they were like scraping the abalone up. But um, yeah, that was pretty. Um, but again, it, it's sort of the testament to not just the relationship between the natural world and the people, but also uh, just the general toughness of these women, which was, you know, just sort of extraordinary. Um, you you talked about how you never shied away from asking women about, you know, the, the female experience. And I want to just talk a little bit of more broadly about, I mean, you are um, someone who writes historical epics from a female point of view which really puts you in a very small group. And then you do it in China and now Korea, which puts you in an even smaller, in fact, it may just be you, Lisa C, who <laughs> writes, you know, female-centric epics. Um, and again, you know, we're all, for two things. First of all, we're just now entering a time where um, daily life is even considered history at all, where, you know, once upon a time, history was wars and kings and uh, boundaries and all of those things. Now. You know, we do have a more um, universal look at, you know, daily life. What What is daily life? What is the position of women? What are the position of the elderly in, uh, in, uh, in a society? I mean, my kids are learning that in school, which I certainly did not. Um, and then we have women's history, which is connected to daily life, but also has its own, you know, challenges some of which is illiteracy, some of which is they, you know, maybe they could write, but they weren't allowed to, or they didn't have the resources to. So you have to fill in so many gaps. And that seems to be a lot of what you do. And do you see that as like part of your um, mandate as a writer? Is that something that moves you as a writer? I mean, obviously you're telling stories about specific characters with themes that you want to explore, but there's also just this you're almost, you know, you're being of service to all of these people who have uh, been left out of history. Yeah, I mean, I do think a lot about that, and I think about how we traditionally learned history, which I think of as being like the front line of history: the wars, the dates, the generals, the presidents, the prime ministers. Uh, but if you, you know, battles. But if you take one step back, who's there? It's women. It's children. It's families. And they're there for every single step of the way. But those aren't the stories that have been told. But and yet they're there. And I, you know, I already sort of alluded to this earlier. It's women who really keep the culture and society together. They're the ones, again, who are keeping the family together, who are feeding the family, who are making sure, and we're certainly seeing this now in the pandemic, you know, women working but also watching their kids, you know, virtually learn, trying to make sure that keeps happening. Plus, I don't know about in, you know, other households, but I know in this household who's going out to the grocery store. And so I feel like anytime, you know, I go to the grocery store, I'm putting my life on the line. So, um, you know, that, that I think it's going to be really interesting, you know, 20, 30 years from now to look back at this time period and to look at what, what, 
what happened in families and how people got got through this time. And that's so, I, I do think a lot of the burden of this time has fallen on women. Well, it has nothing happened. to do with this particular book. It's just... Anyway, yeah. I, you know, yeah, this the job was something I got book. with with um, On Gold Mountain, you know, which is my first book, and it's nonfiction, and it tells the history of the Chinese in America through the eyes of my family that was here in Los Angeles. And I remember, I, I, there was just one day. And of course, I'm, not, I'm. This is not my original thought. Plenty of people have thought this. It just took me a while to get there which is history, we t again, tend to think of it as wars and dates and eras, but actually history is something that happens to individual people. It's something that happens to families. And so that's, I, I, I just think if we can think of history that way. And I, I think sometimes of all of the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of books that have been written about World War II in Europe and the Holocaust, but what's the one book we all remember? The Diary of Anne Frank, you know, because it's personal. It's how that larger history affected her and her family. And we can connect to that because, you know, it, it's not sort of a thing over there, it's personal. Right, and it's about daily life and it's about, yeah. you know, and which makes it, you know, the- Yeah, the and that idea of, you know, do you rise to the occasion or do you fail? Are you loyal or, you know, are you going to betray someone? Are you going to be brave or, are you, you know, but be chicken? And so all of those things that we think about just for ourselves, you know, again, even in this moment. Um, and that's what I love about books, you know, as you open them up and you're turning the pages and, and yes, you're following the plot and all of that, but I connect to the, and this again, for me as a reader, I connect to the characters, whether they're real or imagined, and I start to think about, well, what would I do? You know, what would I do in that situation? And you know, would I be brave? Would I be a coward? Would I again rise to the occasion? Would I fail in some way? And I think what we're doing as readers when we're doing that is, of course, we're connecting to what it means to be human. And in a larger way, you know, we're connecting to this thing we call humanity. And that's what's so great about books and reading, from at least from my perspective, that we can kind of step out of our own lives and experience um, the lives of others, the lives in, of people in other cultures in, in different time periods. And I guess this is why I, you know, all the research shows that readers are more empathetic. That readers are more, I'm sorry, what was Empathetic. What yeah. empathetic they have more empathy or i mean readers you know, there's general. actually been yeah just readers people who read novels and books they tend to be more empathetic i don't know research is scientists have proven this <laughs> i don't know how they do it but they did it. well one of the things that i love about your books is you create these these care these female characters and they're very strong um they're complicated and they're also flawed so so you have you know which would be a traditional storytelling is you have this, you know, um, emotion, an emotionally, what do I want to say, resonant character experiencing, you know, some fairly significant, in some cases tragic, in some cases kind of cool, um, you know, historic events. So that, you know, that that should be enough. But then at the in the heart of each one of the characters, there's like a little flaw. You know, it's like whether you know and, and you see it with you, you're talking about forgiveness and sometimes right. what your characters have to do is forgive themselves because they've made bad choices about the people they love about i mean again not to give too much away but just the the idea of holding a grudge the idea of reading literally reading into something the worst possible interpretation um i think that those kind of things are so universal and yet we, we so often do not see that in, in epic literature, certainly in literature in general, that kind of, yes, things are terrible and bad things are happening and I'm overcoming coming them because I'm strong, but also there's, you know, I've got some issues <laughs> that I have to work through as a person, like we all do. Like we all do. 
Uh, first, I just have to say, every time you say epic, I think I'm going to be like walking around the house <laughs> for another day. Like, epic, epic. <laughs> well, I mean, by any definition. I like, think of, of, of these epic. books as epic. I think of them actually as being just like a little window into somebody's life. So I'm just like, oh my like God, epic. Back I'm just going to be impossible to live with now for at least a couple of days. I cannot um, be the first person who has used that word. It's like, you know, it starts off and, and you all, and it sort of takes you by surprise. It's kind of like, oh, look at this. Now we're moving through this important and that important thing. And it's, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's, but, like, you know, just to your point, though, we are all flawed. I mean, I'd like to say we aren't, but we all do have flaws. And for Young Sook, you know, this inability to forgive whether those reasons are legitimate or not, she feels that. And, and then I guess, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to write about forgiveness was I <clears throat> struggle with it a little myself. And uh, just last week, my husband said it wasn't about him, but he said, you know, remember how you've been talking a lot about forgiveness? <clears throat> I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm still working on it. Um, but I, I think that um, we all, you know, we all have our flaws. And then with Young Suk in particular, she can be so brave. She, she does, you know, she does become the head of the collective. People follow her, and yet she has this deep flaw, and she loses. It. Then the point is, she loses so much. I mean, I don't want to give too much away here, but she loses so much. And then, you know, by the end, she actually has an understanding of what she's lost. And um, I think that's the, you know, the, 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 for me, the very painful part is her, her realization, but finally even being able, I think, to forgive herself and just, you know, I don't, again, I don't want to say what happens at the very end, but I, I do think that that last scene, I, I see it as being very um, optimistic about the future, about her own future, and how she can go forward with her family. Well, the novel is, is you know, it really does sort of use the, the transition of time periods uh, well. So you have, you know, a full story that's happening in present day, whatever present day is. And then you have a whole full, the epic part that's happening mm -hmm. in the past. And how was that to structure? I mean, you know, it, it, obviously when you're telling the story of somebody who whose adventures extend over a decade, you know, flashback or memory or, you know, looking back is, you know, a, a, an obvious solution. But in this one, it's not just that. It's like the actual transformation that you're talking about occurs in the one part in the- right. Yeah, I mean, it's like happening in the big story, but it also happens incrementally in, in these little vignettes. And uh, the way those vignettes, I had not planned on having those. I mean, I didn't plan on having anything that would take place today. But um, I mentioned earlier the old women who sit on the beach who are collecting and sorting the algae. And I just love those women. And I don't know. I just love them so much that the book opens with an old woman sitting on the beach, sorting them, you know, the algae that she washed ashore overnight. And that became a way, um, you know, there's certain things that happen just right in that first scene where Clara and her family have come and, you know, they're holding up this photo. And say, oh, do you know these people? And she's, oh, no, I don't know them, even though one of them is her. And she's like, oh, no, I don't know them. And, and I'll just say one of the things that happened, I won't say every single time, but I maybe like eight out of 10 times with these women on the beach was there would come a moment in real life you know, where, where the woman would say to the, I, well, for that set of interviews, I had a young woman who was a college student who was doing the translation. And they would say to her, oh, could you hold your cell phone next to my ear? You know, shouting because they're, quite hard of hearing, but, um, you know, could you hold your cell phone next to my ear? I need to call my son, my grandson, my nephew. You're so pretty. And he 
he's looking for a wife. And so, I mean, it happens so many times. I have it, photos of it on my website, but also that's how Young Sook gets out of that particular, that very first scene is that Clara, you know, holds the cell phone up to her ear. And Clara in those first, anytime you see her, she's got her, well, they didn't call them earbuds then, but her little, you know, her, her thing that went to her phone, I guess. And um, I just thought she was the most irritating teenager. You know, I just, ugh. and then there's the scene at um, the opening of the 4-3 Memorial um, Complex. And Young Sook is so upset and she runs away and, and Clara follows her. Clara again has those, you know, her things and then and there comes this point where she pulls them out of her ears and puts them into Young Sook's ears. And who's talking? Mija, the her friend, Young Sook's friend, that she's been estranged from. I actually didn't know until that moment what and who um, Clara had been listening to all along. So this thing that had just been irritating me about her, that she was just like <laughs> one of those teenagers, actually had a purpose. I just didn't realize it. No, that was amazing. And also just sort of the, um, you know, in the middle of all this, you also have that nice twist where, uh, you know, the young person is being um, stereotyped the way they often are. They're not listening. They're this, their skirts are too short or whatever. And then she turns out to be, you know, one of the heroes of the story in her own way. Right. Because she refuses yeah. to allow um, this to go. I want to, I'm watching the time because I want to get to um, questions from the audience. But one thing that I wanted to ask you again as a writer, um, you take on some really difficult events. Um, you take on some really difficult topics, you know, foot binding, rape, um, the loss of children, uh, you know, just death, the mortality rate of many of your time periods, many of your situations, it's very high, but also just the brutality of, you know, certain, some of these events. <laughs> you seem like a fairly cheerful person. I, and I'm just curious, how do you keep, how do you capture the importance and the horror and the significance of these things and the impact that it has on not just your characters, but on generations, because you see, you know, it sort of goes up and like not go crazy. I mean, how do you, uh, you know, immerse yourself in these moments and not lose yourself? I would say with this book, I mean, this has the most violence of any book that I've written and I hope ever write. And it was very, very hard for me. And of course, very hard to do that research. I mentioned earlier, the human rights report. And there's stuff that I, I mean, what happens in the novel is pretty bad, but nothing really compared to what actually happened. I mean, the level of atrocities on the island was just, and I wish like I could take a bottle brush and just rub that out of my head. But even now, as we're talking about it, there are images that are coming back. And so that's, that, that was very hard for me with this book, really hard. But I would just say in general, I know what's going to happen to the characters. They don't. And so I would say starting about three months out from the terrible thing that's coming, I just start to worry about them. And, and sometimes I'm trying to figure out how to get them out of it. I remember with um, Shanghai Girls, there's a character, Sam, who commits suicide. And I loved him. I just loved him. He's one of my favorite characters ever. And again, starting about three months out, I just kept trying to figure, and you know, you have an outline, right? So I knew where I was going, but I tried and tried and tried to change his fortune and to change this, what was, I thought, you know, what was supposed to be coming. The more I did to help him, the more cornered he was. And it, that, you know, because it just was really hard because, you know, the thing is, is these characters, have their own destiny that's outside of me. I remember years ago, I, I did an event with, uh, you know, like a group of women and we were the lunch speakers in Florida. And this one woman had written a memoir about her father who was uh, James Jones, who wrote From Here to Eternity and other books. Now I can't remember, and you know, they all grew up in Paris and she was, you know, this little expat kid. 
married to this super famous writer. And I can't remember the book exactly. And I can't remember the name of the character, but you know, there was a private, we'll call him private Smith. And he had been injured and he had developed gangrene. And so he was going to die. And every day his dad, the dad, Jim Jones would come down the stairs out of his office and say, oh, he's going to die. It's just terrible. I feel so bad. It's like, and the kids would say to him, but dad, you're the writer. You know, you're the writer. And he was like, no, he has his own, you know, he has his own destiny that's outside of me. And then one day he opened the door and he's like, he's going to live. He's going to live. And the family broke out the champagne and it was this moment of great joy. But when she told that story, I completely understood it because the characters, they, I mean, obviously I've created them and I do have some control over them, but there does come a point where they do have their own destiny that's really outside of me. And I'm just there to help them get through it. Mm-hmm. But the the sad stuff and the violent stuff is really hard. And so, again, like I said earlier, I just try to be in the room with them, you know, and not not put myself into the story or not how I feel, but just if I can be there and just be there with them as this, <laughs> as this terrible thing that I've created is going to happen to them. Yeah, I guess that when I... It- early on when I used the word detached and I knew it wasn't the right word, there is like that sort of chronicler, which is, you know, to that sort of a clear eyedness about everything. Um, well, I'm looking at the time and I know that it's time for me to go um, throw it open to the Q and A's, but let me just ask you real quick as a final question, what um, are you working on now? Cause so I know earlier we're... I said how I think about things for a really long time. <laughs> uh, about two months ago, I was just, sort of walking by my bookshelves behind me and a spine of a book caught my eye, reproducing women, um, something, something, something in the Ming dynasty. And I just thought, well, I'm in the middle of a pandemic and I've had that book on my shelf for 20 years. I think I'm going to pull it down. And I got to page 19 and there was a mention of a woman who was not the first female doctor in China, but she was the first one to write a book. Uh, in which was published in 1510. And she's just this remarkable person. Her remedies are still used today. And uh, she had quite, quite a life. And, you know, uh, just, I'm so, anyway, instead of thinking for 20 years, this one was like 20 minutes. <laughs> wow. And I'm just now deep into it. And I'm having so much fun in finding just really incredible material, but also people are, can be so helpful. So there is a woman who translated um, Tang Yunshen's book from 1510, and it is available in English. I just had a Zoom interview with her the other day, and she has sent me so much material that could take me years to find, but that she found and and, um, you know, while she was doing her work. So it's just, I'm, I'm reading, reading, reading. And I'm, I've just, I'm February 1st. I'm going to start at page one to, to begin writing the novel. Wow. Okay. So now we have something to look forward to. Well, thank you very much. And um, Donna, if you want to, I think you have the questions from our audience. Yes, I do. We have uh, quite a few um, questions and a lot of people um, wanted to know what many, many readers messaged in to say, what are you working on next? So thank you for answering that because that is the top of mind. Um, But we had some other areas that build on some of the things you talk about. And so I wanted to share those. Our first question comes from a reader named Sarah. And um, she wanted to talk about the henyo. She wanted to know, have the scientists found any actual biological differences between the henyo and average women? Um, Do they pass on these traits to their children? They don't pass on the traits to the children. This really is something that's learned. And they can, you know, we all can learn the, the lung capacity, right? I mean, if we all got, you know, started timing ourselves right now and, and we held our breath and and kept doing that over and over, we would build lung capacity. 
I can tell you that it, you know, it used to be men who were the divers. And then in the mid 17th century, it was Korean king kingdoms period. And the Korean king decided to tax men for their labor. And the men that were like, hmm, how are we going to get around this tax? Oh, we'll send our wives, our mothers, our daughters and sisters into the sea. And it turned out that while women didn't have the same breath capacity as men and couldn't really get develop that as well as men, I mean, I should just say that the world's record for free diving is held by a man at 24 minutes on a single breath. So that's not what these people do, you know, four, five, six minutes for the men. And then for women, it's about four minutes. So that was something that could be learned. But women had a better ability to withstand the cold water. And why? Because we have a little more padding on us. And so this is why it did change from men to women was that, again, they didn't have the same breath capacity, but they could tolerate the cold in ways that men couldn't. That's so interesting. Um, our next question comes from a reader um, named Maggie, and she's in Burbank. And she would like to know, um, have you had any opportunities to uh, uh, interview the Henyo um, since you've published the book? Uh, any feedback on um, what, um, what people there thought about the island of Siwon? I know that, I mean, the book was published in South Korea. It's done quite well there. Part of it is, I think because you know, I wrote about the 4-3 incident, there's very, very little that's been written about that by anyone. But as far as the Henyo, they're illiterate. So they haven't been able to read the book, which is a just, it's very disappointing to me. And I wish that, you know, South Korea had an audio version, but they don't. Uh, our next question comes from a reader named Marcy, and she wanted to ask about On Gold Mountain. Um, and her question is, is there any one person or event in your family history that really surprised you? And she says, thank you and keep on writing. A lot of the questions came in with thank you. So uh, that was just one person uh, who uh, included that. But uh, any, uh, in your rich family, any one story that surprised you? I think for me, the part that really surprised me the most was right at the very, very beginning when I first started interviewing my great aunt, I think it was our second interview. She mentioned in passing a kidnapping. I had never heard of it. My cousin had never heard of it. And it took another two years to get that story. And so I, I, I think for me, the way that a terrible event can happen in a family uh, and how, how that has a ripple effect, but also how we keep secrets and why we would keep something like that a secret. And then again, sort of what the ripple effect of a secret like that can be. And so that certainly, I mean, I just remember that day when she said, oh, you know, blah, 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 kidnapping out of like, what, you know, just had not once heard about it. And I feel like in many ways, just finding that story and how I dealt with that story, the real life story, is, has really helped me with all of my writing. So you started- Again, you know, uh, how, you, how you have secrets, how you hold on to them, why you hold on to them, what happens when they're revealed. So that was your very first book. And at the time you had, um, I know Mary had talked about answering this, but I have to jump in. You had a, a pretty famous mother uh, here in Los Angeles writing books. Um, mm -hmm. What was it like um, when you're um, Carolyn C's daughter and you're publishing your uh, very first book? Um, was that a challenging following those footsteps? So actually, On Gold Mountain technically isn't my first book. My mother and John Espy, who was my mom's longtime companion, uh, the three of us wrote three books together under the pseudonym of Monica Highland for the intersection of Santa Monica and Highland. And we, you know, my mom, I think, really was my biggest supporter. Um, she helped me so much. I feel like it, and my mother's mother, father was a writer too. So I, you know, three generations of writers. And I feel like I had a lifelong apprenticeship, just living around people who were writing from you know, my earliest age. So 
sometimes I joke around like, you know, it's a good thing they weren't plumbers, but on the other hand, why couldn't they have been brain surgeons? <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, uh, our next question comes from uh, Susan. Um, and um, who had mentioned that she really enjoyed uh, the Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane. She says, I read your other book about tea and loved it too. Uh, I'm the adoptive mother of a Korean daughter. Uh, she recently found her birth mom. And do you have personal experience in, with adoption in your own family? Well, I think all of us do if you're old enough. Um, because again, there was a time when we didn't have birth control and young women got pregnant, and, you know, can, more maybe than they do now and, and didn't have the same kinds of options that they have today or not the openness of the culture for a young woman to have a baby on her own. And so like many families, you know, I, I have a, my, what would you be, step grandmother who grew up believing that her that the woman who or it turned out that the woman she thought was her mother was actually her aunt, and the person she thought was her aunt was actually her mother. And I have other examples in my family of things like that. And I, and I think we all, you know, we all do. Be again, because of what the stigma was in the past. And um, earlier when I was talking about just even how I grew up and, and feeling, you know, I, I don't look like everybody else. And what does that mean? And that had made me think about these young women who've been adopted from China or Korea or other parts of the world and and when they don't look like their families. And you know, it's one thing to live in a city like Los Angeles where we have so much diversity. We have so many places that you could take a child if, if let's say you've adopted from China, so many different things you can do, so many classes that they could be in so many things you know that there's just all this stuff but I also have thought a lot about well what if you were adopted by a family somewhere in the middle of the country where you might be the only Chinese space in your family in your class in your school at the church at the synagogue at the county fair and that that really is something that has propelled my my interest in adoption I, I just from you know like my own perspective great uh, thank you um trish a reader would like to know which book is your favorite oh that's like favorite asking child? which one is my favorite child and and everybody who's a mom out there knows the answer it depends on the day <laughs> That's true. Uh, and so this is our final question. Comes from Ron, um, a reader in Spokane. Um, and he would like to know, do you think that Jeju's uh, matrifocal culture is unique? Well, uh, uh, yes and no. I mean, there are other matrifocal cultures and also matriarchal cultures uh, around the world. But the way that this culture developed and the way and the, what these women do, I think does make them really unique. You ha do have the ama, the pearl divers in Japan, uh, the henyo taught the ama, and I, they don't have that same kind of matrifocal uh, aspect to their culture. So this is unique and, and it is unique real, I mean, there are, there is the, a matri matriarchy in China, uh, the Musoa people, um, but to find cultures where it really is focused on women, centered on women, uh, it is unique. And it's, you know, again, unique, not only in Asia, but in the world. But, you know, if we, if we go travel through time and across the globe, you do find other cultures that have it here and there. So uh, I don't know about you, but um, with less commuting, being at home more, I'm I'm reading a lot more. I'm listening to a lot more audiobooks, um, and and I'm just curious. Um, I want to ask this. I'll start with Mary, and then I'd like to ask this to Lisa too. Um, you both are uh, avid avid readers. Um, what's the last book uh, that you just couldn't put down that that really kept you up and and held you captive, Mary? I thought you were just going to ask what we're reading now. So now I have to think. 
Um, well, I've been reading a lot of Lisa C, so I'll go with that. Because yeah. I, it's, it's, a, it's a large <laughs> oeuvre, and I had, not, uh, I had not read all of that. So um, that's what I've been reading. And, and I have to say, there's a, I know it is an epic because there's like this, it's a page turn. You just want to see what happens next. It's amazing. Um, and also the Amelia Peabody series. I always read them when I want to feel better because they're wonderful. Thank you. Lisa. The book that I read most recently that was a real page turner for me was the most recent uh, Michael, Con not the one that just came out, but the, just the one six months ago by Michael Connolly. Uh, something innocent. I forgot the title. I'm sorry to say, but he, I just think he's a master. And he just gets better. And I mean, even though he's really prolific, he just gets better and better and better. And then right now I'm reading Interior Chinatown, which just won the National Book Award. Thank you. Um, do you have, uh, you just uh, mentioned two wonderful LA uh, writers. Who are some of your other favorite uh, LA writers? Well, of course my mom, <laughs> I didn't say oh, my mom's books. Um, my favorites of hers are Making History in Golden Days, but I, I would say Nina Revoir, Steph Cha, Linnell George, um, who else? Uh, you know, Raymond Chandler. Um, I love, I just love mysteries. So when anyone has something new to say about Los Angeles through that lens, I'm, I'm just there for it. I had the uh, pleasure of working with your mom on the My California Anthology. Um, and it was one of my, my favorite uh, editing projects ever. So yeah, she's a longtime favorite of mine as well. Um, I was delighted that uh, we could have you here to the book club. So I just wanted to thank you both. What a fascinating uh, conversation and, and what a great evening. Um, just, I love the way you both took uh, your conversation way beyond the book and, uh, and just made it so relevant to our lives right now. Um, one thing I wanted to um, just remind our readers to, to mark your calendar. We have um, our next book club events are all set. Uh, February 24th, uh, we're gonna be welcoming Australian novelist, Charlotte McConaughey, author of Migrations. Um, it's uh, um, an environmental climate change novel that is just an amazing read and um, hope everyone will join us. And then on March 10th, uh, we'll be welcoming um, Southern California author Viet Tan Nguyen. Um, he'll be talking about the sequel to his Pulitzer Prize winning novel. His new book, The Committed, uh, comes out in early March. Um, so uh, sign up for the LA Times Book Club uh, newsletter and we'll keep you in the loop. And now I just would like to uh, thank Mary and Lisa uh, for joining us and, and thank you all of the readers. This, so we ha always have a really great uh, outpouring every month, but there's really been nothing uh, like uh, just the onslaught of people who were so excited that you were going to be joining our community book club. So I just want to say thank you, Lisa. This has really been oh, an honor. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you, Mary, for those just great questions. This was wonderful. And I hope Soon we can all be together, you know, in person. And this is Mary's second time back to the book club. Um, she last interviewed Julie Andrews for us. So I got to tell you, we only bring Mary on for the, the real heavyweights here. <laughs> for the epics. The epic. The epic for the epic Thank authors. You. Really great. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for asking me, Donna. And it was really great to uh, meet you, Lisa. Big fan. Well, thank you uh, both. And uh, good night. Good night. Good night. Stay safe, everybody. Yeah. Wear a mask.